Welcome to Dementia Friendly Prince George's County, Maryland Northern Sector Webinar Series for Caregivers. Today's topic is Building Caregiver Resilience, sponsored by Prince George's County Government and the Department of Family Services. Hi, my name is Ann Cranin, and I'm here to talk about building caregiver resilience. And if you have chosen uh, to listen to this webinar, it's probably because you are a caregiver and uh, you are facing challenging times and uh, would like to know how to weather this, this challenge a little better. Uh, so the first thing I want you to know is that you're not alone. Uh, if you look at the statistics here, there are over 40 million family caregivers in the United States and family members provide 80% of the care for our seniors, 80% of it, providing $470, $470 billion in unpaid services every year. Now, it's probably not a surprise to note that 75% of those caregivers are women, and 67% are caring for someone over 75. You know, they say, you know, 50 is the new 40 and I guess 70 is the new 60, but uh, our, our seniors that we're caring for are older. 60% uh, of our caregivers are also working full or part-time. So you guys, your plates are full. 46% of caregivers are providing complex care. That might be wound care, med management. You might be doing um, blood sugar tests. You might be doing injections. And 55% of these family caregivers report being physically or emotionally exhausted. But 83% of them say caregiving is a positive experience for them. They find value in it. Uh, so when we look at the challenges, these are just some more of those statistics. Uh, one out of every four caregivers say family relationships suffer. And I know personally, I was a caregiver for my well, for lots of people, for, for my grandmothers, for my father, for my mother, but most, most recently was my mother who lived with myself and my kids. And we would have dinner at the table, but my mother had dementia and we'd be talking and she would ask a question and it would delay the conversation. And if you have teenage children who are happy to talk to you, you don't wanna be shutting them down. But it got very difficult to have conversations at the table simply because we were caring for my mom. And eventually what we did was we had her uh, have her dinner separately and I would spend time with her and then I would have dinner with my kids because they need to talk. 27% uh, of caregivers are in the sandwich generation. So they're caring not only for their parent, but they may be caring for a child. I used to joke that I was in the club sandwich generation because I had, I wasn't caring for my grandchildren, but I had grandchildren coming. I was. I still had children in my home. My oldest daughter was married and having a family. Still had a uh, like a 12 year old in my home. And then I was caring for my mother. Uh, caregivers want help. They don't often know how to get it. Um, and then they don't take care of themselves. 67% of caregivers say they don't go to the doctor because they're putting the needs of this other person first. And uh, the point of this presentation is to help you figure out how to care for yourself as well. 16% uh, of caregivers quit their job in order to care for a loved one. I was speaking with a woman recently who told me just that. She was looking forward to uh, quitting her job because she needed to care for both of her parents. And then caregivers are providing more than 10 hours of care to a loved one each week. And many are providing far more hours than that, as you guys may know. Um, and then this other statistics down here in the bottom left corner, more than 34 million people provide care to someone age 18 or older who is ill or has a disability. So caregiving, you know, I think of it primarily because I'm an aging life care manager, I think of it primarily in terms of seniors, but We've got people who are caring for disabled children or someone with mental health issues, and then many times also caring for a senior or maybe a senior who has mental health issues. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So all those statistics aside, no two caregivers are alike. Some of us are full-time, some of us are part-time, 
some caregivers are at a distance. I work with people who, you know, they may live in California or Boston or wherever, and they're trying to manage and oversee the care for their loved one here locally. Uh, they, you may be family, you may be friends, maybe paid caregivers. And then uh, some, of it come, some of us come to it reluctantly, or we may come to it willingly. We may do it out of love, or we may do it out of obligation. I have talked with clients whose parents were not the easiest parents to work with and, uh, and never had been, and yet they felt a responsibility to care for their family. Um, and then some have these deep wealth of relationship that they're building on and caregiving usually is a little easier for them because, um, or emotionally easier because they love that person. Uh, okay, let's go ahead. So when we talk about building resilience, first I think we need to think about what we mean by that. And resilience is the ability to maintain well-being and effective functioning in the face of high levels of disruption. And, and disruption is what caregiving is. It's not like a regular job. Uh, you're usually trying to manage your own life in the midst of caregiving. Uh, caregiving, or excuse me, resilience involves adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, threats, or stress. Um, and it's that just that ability to keep weathering the storms, which is what this next one speaks of. Being able to bounce back from difficulties with family relationships, health, workplace, home life, finances, et cetera. It's that rebounding from a crisis and the ability to adjust and find a new normal. And I think um, caregiving often comes in storms. Uh, something happens and then, you know, if we keep carrying that stress as opposed to bouncing back to whatever the new normal is, then that stress keeps building. And we have to figure out how to, how to manage those things. <laughs> Um, here are some caregiver myths that prevent resilience. And there's this woman who you see her with, uh, looks like she's got her computer and she's got a bucket to clean the house. She's got to walk the dog. She's thinking about her mother and her mother's medicines and she's got grocery shopping and, and I can add laundry and uh, appointments and so many other things. And caregivers think they have to be on top of everything. And, and it's not reasonable. You're often doing the job of four or five people. You know, if your loved one was living in an assisted living or a, a group home, something like that, there would be people to do laundry. There's people who plan and do the meals, order the food, which is not necessarily the same person who plans and prepares meals. Uh, people who, you know, order the food. Then there's people who provide physical care. Then there's somebody who comes in every so often and does hair. You're doing the job, not to mention cleaning the facility, right? You're doing and responsible for the jobs of five or six people when you care for this one person as a primary caregiver. So being on top of everything is not necessarily realistic. Another myth is that I should never get frustrated. Uh, and that's uh, not human. I mean, we're all human. We're gonna get frustrated. We have to figure out how to handle our frustrations. Another myth is that I can't talk about what I'm experiencing. And I think it's important to find a safe place, be it a support group, a good friend, somebody you know who's in a similar season of life, uh, somebody at your church, whatever, somebody that you can talk to about what's going on. And the other one is that my needs should always take a back seat. And a lot of caregivers just feel guilty when they go to do something for themselves, that kind of thing. Uh, or to take time away from the person because they know the person's lonely without them. But um, I like to remember the, you know, the uh, airline where when the uh, two, ma you know, the oxygen masks come down and they always tell you, mask yourself first, then mask the child or disabled person who's with you. If we don't take care of ourselves, we are not going to be able to do a good job caring for that person that we are. Um, responsible for. Uh, let's see, more myths. <clears throat> Excuse me. Other caregivers know what to do. They provide better care. They handle things better. You know, I think in this age of social media, uh, we're always comparing ourselves to someone else's best, to their good day when they post this 
great picture of their family. And we're not seeing all the all the other moments that they didn't take a picture of and post. And the same thing is true with caregivers. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing them at their best when they're out and they're talking about what they did with their mom and, or their dad. And uh, we assume that they're always doing things better. The other myth or an, another myth is I should be able to do it all by myself. And that's, like I said earlier, you're doing the job of half a dozen different people. You're going to need help and you need to be strategic in where you look for help and how to, how to garner it. Uh, the other thing is that you shouldn't tell your boss what's going on. And in most work environments, a boss will be understanding. They, they may, well, right now we're all, many of us working from home, but they might be able to work with you to uh, create some strategy for you to be able to maybe take a few less hours working or be able to work from home or whatever. They're a good resource and the um, Family Medical Leave Act, you know, gives you some options as far as taking time off if you need to. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I wanted to talk about is identifying your resilience muscles. And these are the things that we need to use, exercise, work on in order to help us be resilient. Uh, one is positivity. That's the ability to see hope in the darkest of times. It can keep you going in the face of impossible odds and help you bring your energy to deal with a challenge or resolve a problem. And you'll, you'll see that where some people just respond to a challenge with, I don't know what I'm gonna do. This is so hard. There's no way out of this. And other people are like, well, there's a way. We're gonna figure it out. And if you can work yourself towards uh, that positivity, um, and confidence, uh, the ability to act in difficulties, enhanced when you have confidence in your capabilities and your knowledge of your own strengths. Um, and I think that just uh, knowing, keeping yourself educated and informed is going to improve your confidence um, and prioritizing the ability to quickly decide what's most important and tune out distractions. And for some people, that's very difficult. I had an evening where my mother needed care. My son injured his eye with a airsoft rifle. No kidding. He's fine. And one of my daughters called and said she was in labor. Her water had broken. And, and I just had this moment of what am I going to do? And then I was able to prioritize and you deal with the eye first. And somebody else went to deal with these other two situations. But that ability to make those decisions and tune out the noise, the distraction about the other thing, because you can't do it all perfectly at every moment. You're gonna have to prioritize and shift. Uh, creativity, and that's that, uh, that stretching our brains to come up with a new way to deal with the challenge. Uh, I often tell people that when the stress is rising in your home as a caregiver or in the home of the person you're caring for, whatever, when your stress is rising, it usually means there is a change necessary. Uh, maybe mom is demanding more attention. Maybe, maybe dad's lost the ability to communicate and the stress is rising because he's, he's not communicating with words now. He's, uh, you know, clapping his hands and demanding attention and throwing things or whatever. Uh, that's where we need to come up with our creativity to come up with a new way to handle things. Uh, and uh, it increases our chances of having a positive outcome. I, I also uh, refer people often to, there are some video snippets that you can catch on YouTube by Teepa Snow, T-E-E-P-A uh, Snow. And she does some uh, videos about communicating with people with dementia and she's just so creative. Uh, and it's just really helpful to see uh, her classes are longer and you pay to see them, but there are some YouTube snippets and they're worthwhile of how you can turn a difficult situation kind of on its head. Um, and another piece of resilience here, this next one on the page is connection. 
and dealing with a crisis, dealing with caregiving, it's a team endeavor. And if you can build strong connections with other people and you know where to reach out in time of help for help, or when you know where to reach out when you just need another idea or somebody to come alongside you, then you can go beyond your own limits and resolve issues that seemed impossible. So I just think it's important to work on developing those uh, things and we're gonna talk a little more about them as we go on. So now we're looking at some steps towards building resilience. One is accepting that change is a part of living. Like I said earlier, when you might have everything smooth sailing and then the stress is rising and all of a sudden you realize this situation is untenable. It's, it's because something needs to change. And somebody who is dealing with dementia is not on a, usually not on a smooth path. There are gonna be losses. This is a disease of loss and the change is going to come. Um, the next step there is setting reasonable attainable goals. Uh, you know, spending some time with mom every day, uh, doing an activity or reading or going through a photo album. That might be reasonable and attainable for you. But if you're out at a job eight hours a day and you come home and you're fixing mom's dinner and helping her get ready for bed and all of this, that might not be reasonable. So you need to set reasonable, attainable goals. And then people who are full-time caregivers often think, well, I should do something with them all morning and then we have lunch and they lie down for a rest and then I need to entertain them all afternoon. That's not, that's not reasonable. You're not an activities director. There are pieces you wanna add in, but you can't be a full-time activities director and a full-time caregiver and manage your own life. Uh, another step is nurturing a positive view of yourself. And I think that's, that's so helpful. And I, I always recommend time in the morning of you know reading. Uh, I like to read scripture, but you can read whatever things to help you uh, focus on uh, your task, your calling, what you're doing, and and that you're doing it well. That you're that you're doing it, and you're getting through it. Um, let's see, keeping things in perspective. Yeah, that's a hard one. Uh, there are people for whom you know when one thing happens, it becomes a crisis, and it's like no, you've you've got to balance things. Christ, you have to avoid seeing these crises as insurmountable. Pretty much most crises we overcome. Uh, we, we have to figure out what's needed and then we make decisive actions or take decisive actions. Um, but that, that whole keeping it all in perspective and not letting everything be a crisis. Nope, it's a new challenge, something you're gonna have to work on, figure out, but it's, it's usually not a crisis. Um, and even when there's a crisis, there, there's a, another side to the crisis. Um, and then down here at the bottom, making connections. This is just so important to not just accepting help and support, but as we'll talk about looking for help and support. And there's an awful lot of caregivers who are isolated, alone, taking care of the person they're caring for with, with no outside help, no relationships. And those are so important and we can find them in many different places, um, but we have to, we have to make it a priority to find them. Uh, okay, so caregiver burnout. Lack of resilience contributes to caregiver burnout. And I don't know about you guys, but I certainly as a caregiver saw all these things in myself. Mood swings, short fuse, uh, constantly getting sick, running, you know, coming up with every cold that comes by, you catch it. Losing touch with your friends and uh, not having motivation. You're on call 24 seven, you're headed for caregiver burnout if you're not already there. Um, and caregiver burnout is just a state of physical, emotional, mental exhaustion. And it occurs when caregivers don't get the support they need or they try to do more than they're able to, either physically, financially, emotionally. Um, Caregivers often fail to seek out help because they feel guilty if they spend time on themselves or if they ask someone else to come in and they're not the one there with their mom. Um, so, and then those are the traits of caregiver burnout. Uh, so 
here are some particular things to do as a caregiver, ask for help. That involves sharing your problems. And if you have in a family situation, usually one person ends up being the primary caregiver. I have dealt with some families that share it well, but that is not what I typically see. Um, and I think asking for help, and even if you have a, uh, it's easy to think, well, they can't because they're living at a distance, but the person who's living at a distance, maybe they can uh, oversee, you know, we do online banking now, maybe they can oversee the bills. Maybe they can, uh, if they're financially set, maybe they can pay for a caregiver to come in, a paid caregiver to come in one weekend a month so that you get away. Um, there's things that uh, other family members can do and usually they don't know what to do. So you, at some point you have to kind of brainstorm and come up with some ideas. Um, guilt versus regret. And uh, I think it's important to remember, you are not responsible for this person's illness. So at some point, I, I regret that we have to bring in paid caregivers, but I'm not. I'm not guilty for that. I'm. I'm. I'm here caring for you. You know, five days a week, and on the weekend, I need a break. Or I often tell caregivers. This is kind of off the agenda here, but. I tell givers, you need a little bit of time every day that's for yourself, whether it's in the morning when you exercise or you uh, spend some time uh, reading things that are helpful to you, uh, but, but you need a little time every day. You also need a substantial period of time once a week, whether you get a paid caregiver for one evening a week or one morning a week, if you're married, you need a date night with your spouse, uh, unless they're the person you're caring for. Um, but you need some time out, get coffee with a friend, go shopping, even doing your errands. If you have a paid caregiver can feel like such a relief because you're away from home. Um, but you're uh, going back to this guilt versus, you know, blame and guilt and regret neither you nor the person you're caring for is responsible for the disease that they have, I'm presuming dementia, um, and nor for its progression or its effects. And uh, I think we have to be careful we're not blaming them, but also that we're not feeling guilty as the disease progresses, that somehow I didn't do X, Y, or Z, and so their disease is prog progressing. The disease is going to progress. That is the nature of dementia. Uh, next thing here is find respite. I guess I kind of hit that one already. Uh, important to take time to relax and do enjoyable things. And that's where I'm talking about getting time away. I also tell people you regularly and your income and your situation will dictate this. But if you can do it once a month, you can't do it once a month uh, as often as you can a weekend away that two days away from a caregiving situation and you will be refreshed and you will be a better caregiver for it. Uh, the next one here is getting advice and not being afraid to talk about the changes in, that you're seeing in your person with dementia and your challenges in your role as a caregiver. Uh, I don't personally find that physicians are generally the best place for that advice, but that seems to be where we often see people going. Um, the, a number of places sponsor support groups for caregivers of people with dementia. Right now there are online groups uh, and just finding a place where other people are experiencing what you're experiencing and, and can advise you. It's kind of like when you have a, you have children, you read all these books about, uh, you know, pregnancy and babe, the time of a baby and then rearing children. We don't have a lot of stuff that really prepares us for this stage of life. And yet most of us go through it at one time or another, caring for an elderly uh, loved one. Okay. Tips for family caregivers. I've probably hit a bunch of these already. Seek support from others. We've talked about that. Taking care of yourself. I think it's important to also address that medically. You need to take care of yourself. You will not be around to care for your loved one 
if you don't also take care of yourself. And there's a statistic that is, I forget the number, but it's a very like 60 some percent or something of family caregivers who die before the person they're caring for. Now that also includes people clearly of the same generation, but it includes younger people as well. And we've had people uh, we've known who, you know, left blood pressure unattended and had a stroke. And now we've got an elderly person with care needs and you, and you, you've just got to find a way to care for yourself and those walks, whatever it is, um, accept offers of help. And I think that's so hard. Neighbors will often say, is there anything I can do? What well, you need a running list of what it is people could do and to brainstorm who you could ask and maybe get someone else to help you brainstorm. Uh, learn to communicate effectively with doctors. I often recommend to people that they get, of course now in the age of electronics, it's a little different, but a, uh, often uh, people middle-aged and up, we, we handle paper better. But if you get like a composition book where the pages are sewn in and you write down notes, questions, Leave it in their home. If you're if you're having people come in and out caring for, someone else can write down a note, a question. Uh, you can record blood pressures there or blood sugars or whatever. Take that when you go to the doctors and just scan back over the pages since the last visit and see what concerns you have. And take notes on what the doctor said. Uh, caregiving is hard. Schedule respites. I'm going to say that over and over. Watch for signs of depression and get help. Uh, it is just difficult. And there are times when it's going to get hard and don't delay getting help for that. Um, be open to new technologies so that it can help you care for loved ones. Now there's all kinds of cool stuff out there now. When I was caring for my mother uh, and she moved in with me and she lived in the basement of my house. We had a basement apartment that walked out to the yard, but she did have dementia and we had moved into this house together and we'd been here about four months when I broke my ankle and I lived two floors. My bedroom was two floors above hers. So I knew she got up at night sometimes and I would sometimes just go down and check on her in the night, but with a broken ankle, that was obviously not a good option. So we bought one of these, those uh, video baby monitors. This has probably been 15, 10 or 15 years ago. They were like new video baby monitor. And I could just flip it on and off and see whether she was in the bed or not. And if she wasn't, then I would get one of my kids to go down and check on her. But it, it helped me not to worry so much. That was a new technology then. Now there's all kinds of things. You can get uh, things that uh, have cameras that you can set up that then go by go on Wi-Fi and then you can go on your phone and look and see what's doing, what's going on. And if you have caregivers coming in and out, I think that's a great idea. Um, next one is organized medical info. So it's up to date and easy to find. I think it's important. I did this with a client this week where his medicines had changed and he had to go out to the hospital in an emergency. I just grabbed a bag, dropped all his medicine in it. Now, how much better would it have been if I'd have had a nice list that I could have handed them and they could have copied because then I had to read off each bottle and they had to write down, but I didn't have that list with me. Uh, but having everything organized and up to date and maybe keep it with that composition book um, so that you can take that with you in an emergency um, or just to a regular appointment. Uh, number nine, make sure legal documents are in order. That should almost be up there at number one because uh, there is, for people with dementia, there is a window of time in which they probably can still execute legal documents. They can, they're still legally uh, able to make those decisions and identify who they want to have as their power of attorney for health and power of attorney for other things and maybe update their will, that kind of stuff. Those are so important uh, because in for some people with dementia, they, they're un, some are cooperative with care and maybe that power of attorney never comes into question. Some are not. And if you don't have a power of attorney, guardianship is an expensive, difficult road to travel. Uh, it costs 
uh, a lot of money. I did it with somebody in the last few years. It took us well over a year. Now there are crises where they will do hearings more quickly, but they're not easy. You do not wanna go that route if you can get those documents done in a timely fashion. Uh, number 10, give yourself credit for doing the best you can in one of the jobs, one of the toughest jobs there is. And this really is, uh, it's a job most of us are doing out of love for the person, but, but it's hard, it's hard. I remember feeding my mother, uh, you know, we we're spoon feeding her at this point. And I, I was never patient feeding my own children, frankly, spoon feeding, but I was doing this and it just made me kind of crazy sitting there, it took so long. And I came upstairs and I thought, why is this? I said to one of my daughters, why is this so much harder? I mean, I spoon fed you all. And uh, she said, yeah, but she's first, she said, well, I'm hoping we were cuter than grandma is right now. And, uh, and secondly, you knew we were gonna grow uh, and not need that forever. And with grandma, it's getting worse. And it, it is, it's just a hard job and it's unrelenting. So if you get through the day, you've done a good job. Uh, let's move on here. Um, okay, creating your own support team. Who's gonna take care of you? Caregiving really takes a toll. So to spend some time, get out a piece of paper, jot down, who, who can I count on? Who could come in once a week and read to mom so I could go out or sit with mom? Who could, maybe, who could I ask that would take mom out for a little while so that I can be in my home and get things done that I need to do or get a nap? Uh, who could advise me on finances? Who do I know that, that is the go-to person who knows all the people I should be looking for to uh, get repairs done around my house or deal with um, you know, people who bring in meals or whatever. Like there, in most of us, we have a network of friends and there is somebody who is the go-to person. Well, go to them. Uh, so identifying your team, and I would go so far as to write it down because when you are in a crisis, when you are depressed, when you're stressed out, you can't come up with that list of names. It's very difficult. Uh, let's see what we're doing next. Oh, we're summarizing here. So resilience is within all of us. We need to just identify what it will take, that positivity, the creativity, the uh, not viewing things as a crisis, uh, being sure that you can get through it, uh, identify those things, even write them down and review them. Um, and it, it, dispelling those caregiver myths is really essential to building resilience. You cannot believe those things, that everybody else does it better, that, uh, I'm trying to think what the other myths were. Uh, and I think, but I'll say right now, coupled with everybody else does it better, there's also the myth of no one else can do it like I can. Mom won't want anyone else. But it's not always what is best for mom. It's what's best in the situation. And you are part of that situation. You have to look at what's best for you as well. Um, um, and then just creating your team who will take care of you. I think that's important is that team is to support you as you support the person you're caring for. And they are, uh, every bit is important because as I've said many, many times, if you don't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of them. If you take good care of yourself, you will be able to care for them longer. It will be longer before they need to go to assisted living or they need to whatever. Uh, go to a nursing home before you need to bring in hired caregivers. Uh, but that creating your own support team is just essential. And this is usually where I ask for questions. Uh, clearly, you guys can't ask me questions, but feel free to email me. My email is down there, uh, as is the web page for my business. And there's a Facebook page. I often post uh, articles are pertinent to caregivers um, and 
that is all. So good to speak with you guys and take care. Be sure to let me know if you have any questions or comments.